There we go. We are recording. So hello, everybody, and welcome to uh, TGI, which stands for, I forgot to hit mute all, but everybody muted yourselves because you're nice, responsible people. Um, uh, TGI currently stands for the greatest indoor reading series. It originally stood for the great indoors, but um, as I mentioned last week, uh, there's a home decor podcast that uh, has all that all over the internet, and I am getting emails about home decor so we, we'll see. We'll figure it out. But uh, my name is Rich Creswell. I am a um, human being, I guess, principally. I, my job role has become more confusing as work has changed during the pandemic. Uh, I've done audiobook narration, and uh, I like to read books. Um, and my uh, partner in life, Trina Thibodeau, who's hiding behind my head, and she's in the other Zoom window, uh, started this as a way to ensure that we could get a little bit of uh, community during a time when we weren't allowed to go see each other. So since then, it has, uh, that started back at the, in March. And since then, we've you know, had one of these just about every Friday night, uh, made some great friends, made some great connections, and gotten a chance to hear from people all over the country and uh, several people outside of the United States as well, zooming in from other parts of the world. So it's really um, expanded my world, I can say personally, and I think um, really given us a chance and given uh, writers a chance to share their work with, uh, with a new audience. So hopefully we will get to do that again tonight. Um, a, I could tell you all about the places to go on the internet to find us, but the fact is you're in here right now. So why don't I just do that at the end? Cause that makes more sense. So I'm just going to go ahead and say that, uh, tonight we have four, uh, readers we have a wonderful lineup of people, um, based on their bios and getting a chance to chat with them a little bit beforehand. They all seem lovely. Uh, and I'm quite excited. Ooh, actually one of them just one of them just got here. Anyway, we got everybody now, so we're good. Um, so I'm gonna start with Mr. Andrew K. Peterson. Uh, he is the author of four poetry books, most recently, Good Game, released by Spite and Dival Press in 2020. In 2017, his chapbook, The Big Game is Every Night, was mailed to the White House alongside other publications from the Lakofo Chaps series as a collective literary protest. His previous chapbook, Bonjour Merryweather and the Rabid Maps, Fact Simile Press, was featured in an exhibition on poets' maps at the University of Arizona's Poetry Center. Peterson's writings has been anthologized in Emergency Index from Ugly Duckling Press and the Earth Archive installation at RISD Museum. In 2017, he co-organized the Boston Poetry Marathon, a three-day poetry event featuring 100-plus writers. A co-founder and editor of the online lit journal Summerstock, he lives in Boston. So without further uh, foo for all from myself, Andrew, you can take us away. Thank you so much, Ridge. Uh, first, can you, can you hear me all right? Good. Okay, cool. Lots of thumbs up. <laughs> um, so thank you so much, Ridge and Trina and Noli for this um, wonderful uh, space, temporary autonomous zone for, for keeping... Uh, the world safe for poetry and prose and discourse and community. Um, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, sorry, transitioning. Uh, it's been one of those days where, um, you know, when you like go to set up, uh, make yourself a cup of coffee in the morning and you forget to put the cup underneath the Keurig uh, thing. So it's been kind of like that. It's not a metaphor either. That was, that was my morning. So. Uh, AKA 2020, I guess. Um, all right, so uh, I think I'll start, since we were talking about uh, cool mask designs and so forth, um, I, I have a, uh, a poem that uh, is more my re most recent one. It's from um, a series I've been working on um, where I'm writing in a notebook and using a different colored pen for each poem just as a way of exploring color and emotion, memory, and so forth. So. Um, I'm also a big fan of ekphrastic poetry, writing about things. So um, I have this ode to uh, my mask, which uh, is a lovely, has a lovely uh, Day of the Dead um, vibe going on it from a local uh, surf shop down in uh, Marshfield, where I'm from. Um, so, all right, I'll just get to it. Uh, this is called Blue Magic. And so labor past sunburnt hydrangeas. Holes splintering the overgrown hilltop park at dusk. Grass 
retiring its colors. I remove my avatar, masked like a full cloud, bleached in the heat, three drinking skeletons dealing cards on a wobbly teal wave. Old friends, mid-road, who share their laurel crown and dried gardenia eyes. A hobbled artist paints their faces, aces and eights, onto red doors of the smoking cantina, about to swing open like a hip bone plucked by a thumb. Brushing past the whiskey spill, the skull-tipped violinist places a final chord back into head soak, the only song she keeps in her heartless cage, with a little neck roll trick that keels her straw hat forward, crowned down, able to receive the extra ante. The last ace dealt, the winning skeleton sparkles in the smelt, bowing beyond the trees so tall and full and time again to reapply this simple penance and picture and photo of the moon's blue magic and labor back down the hill to you, grass returning to its colors. Um, okay, so thanks. <laughs> like the waves. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just gonna read a bunch uh, uh, the rest of the time from my book, um, which Ridge mentioned. Um, it's called Good Game. Uh, which was released earlier this year from Spite and Dival. Um, kind of a weird time to be releasing a book and trying to share it, but um, yeah, it's been uh, it's been fun, given what it is. So, um, hmm. okay, I guess I'll start with this one. Um, this is dedicated to a friend, uh, my friend poet Joe Cooper, who uh, was a friend of mine at, at Naropa University, where we were studying for our MFA. Um, Joe lives in uh, rural Virginia now with his family, but uh, he used to live in Buffalo, and I used to drive out there and visit him, and, and we would collaborate and, and have great lost weekends together. So this is sort of written with him and of him, of the experience uh, visiting him. So uh, my heart is full of buffalo wings. Because my love is a personal broken record for the most wild, crispy mediums eaten in one sitting, my heart is full of buffalo wings and greasy pre-residues. When we come back in the bar from smoking, a stranger's thumbing the book you left behind. Everyone seems the same kind of nervous, but you're not. He talks crazy wisdom. Months later in the blink you'll send, I still can't read the monk, but hear what he's laughing. Sometimes I wonder if I am a butterfly dreaming that I am a man, or if I am a man dreaming I am a butterfly. Sometimes I wonder what a heart attack might look like from the inside out, maybe a monk laughing at the moon while all around the randomness sings, mama, there goes that man, Rudy's all around, the love you save may be your own. Above the dark bar are dodgers and giants. When you see me in the mirror, I forget which one I am. This one's called Sycamore Flesh. Uh, to be read aloud and placed on a sycamore trunk outside of JFK's birthplace, 84 Beale Street, Brookline, Massachusetts, Independence Day, 2018. One, burn cedar, sandalwood, pinion for this question. Isn't are you suffering, but who you're suffering with? A lack that shocks itself awake from blue armed tragedy, the repertoire pretty evenly split along fascist lines. Order me another no thank you, with courage to outrage and out edge age. One thousand paper cranes, your arms are dreams to heal in. I'd be okay a hummingbird in mist upstaged by bloom. Two, child brandishes a head sized snowball through crowded crosswalks, tossing and catching, tossing and catching and catching. Doesn't make a map for any meeting under the orphan ceilings geography of loss. Three, like how to cope with this shits with this know-how that can, will, or does not wash itself ashore. 
a shape less like rain than thunder, less like a mob than moth brim, less like a walk the plank than pliant page of cups, more like a damned saint in oracle fever, more like what summer stalks sing back in bulk, hungry knots that leak thirst, and how what empties from a borderless world will remember you. Poem placed on the Boston University footbridge over Storrow Drive, where Santos LeBoy was shot and killed by Massachusetts State Trooper June 19th, 2015. Thorn trees bloom by a little village in southern Brazil, named, I'm told, misunderstanding loose translation for nearby thorns, Nao me toque, don't touch me. Will not cross you anymore, bridge crossed too many times. When I can barely hold my own hands, it forgives. When there's nothing to forget it, forgive me all my words, touch this form of absence. Now me toque, now me toque. No need to chase the man just because he runs. Mm -hmm. Charlotte gave me a list of some of her favorite poems, so I'm trying to read a couple of those for her. Charlotte's here, and Charlotte read her last week. It was the last week, a couple weeks ago. I'm really bummed that I missed it, and I apologize. Uh, I'll do this one. Uh, this one's in memory of uh, David Berman, lead singer of uh, Silver Jews, wonderful poet, writer also. Elegy with Saffron and Honey. Afraid sometimes to die, I sleep alone in the big, big city, in the big, 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 big night, off leash from these chariots of flesh, speaking of wham and colonial pull downs, designed to lie among stars that live their endless displays that drain the beautiful from beauty. A weak yet faithful flash coils in the drawl around an unfinished front inside a naval reach, a retrograde ignored. Take this golden palm, give me license and chariot, sting a song and sing a sign. Another star, vaguely errant, wanders from blunderings, loosed from the spangled order as bling at the tiki bar. It's galactic ancient tenements, laughing in rhythm, laughing on key, laughing back at the laughers, air spilling everywhere. Could you imagine dancing in the aisles, stomping in time to the tune of this sweet slinging sphere? Thank you. Uh, um, okay, so I think I've got time for one last one. Um, again, thank you so much for, for having me. This has been a real treat and you know, highlight of my week and month. So uh, cheers to you all. I can't wait to hear the other readers. This is really great. Um, okay, this last one's in memory of another favorite musician. Um, this one's called Serious Moonlight for David Bowie. Moonlight, a monument to memories, fresh dance clothes set to a tremble. Moonlight, the Rhodes laminate foxglove blotting out forgottens. Moonlight on a violin, eyelash, dilated lunar synthesizer. Moonlight as whales swim backwards to the top of a waterfall. Moonlight windows in a bubble, in afternoon plain sight. Moonlight faster than sap. Moonlight above the genocide. Would you moonlight if you knew? Moonlight on a crowd of blue haloed mourners. Moonlight. moonlight Pained minerals on the orphan chapel ceiling. Moonlight above friends' arms linked in protest. Moonlight from all directions where you cannot reach. Moonlight, moonlight, goose, ghost conch ululating alms culminating in urm flame. Moonlight on the moon where neither seem lost. Moonlight in the moonlight, in the serious moonlight of an O oh, unserious moon.
thank you so much for your attention. Appreciate it so much. Thanks. <laughs> oh, Andrew, thank you uh, for coming and sharing your work. Uh, first, first thing that occurs to me is you're, you're a wonderful reader. You know, in in terms of I can tell the amount of time that you spent on the sound of the poem, and I loved. Uh, that so many of the poems had a dedication or a purpose or an intention behind them, especially um, the one that struck me was the poem that was to be read aloud and then pinned to a tree. You know, there's something about that that's like, um, it frames the poem as more of an, an event and a serious, you know, piece of, of um, action in the world, I guess would be the best way to say it. And, uh, you know, I think, the same with the dedication you know it puts something in our minds but it also so it kind of lets us know um maybe where you were coming from what you were thinking about or whatever but it also uh i don't want to say predisposes us to a certain state while we're listening but it, it almost is it's part of it as well right it's part of the communication um and then otherwise i just you're you're your titles, your opening lines, your closing lines, your choice of words, just literally the physical sounds of your work is absolutely beautiful. So it was really great to get to hear you. Thank you so much for, uh, for coming on. And um, I did just want to mention, you know, we've had a few people who've uh, had stymied book launches because of COVID, you know, it's, it's people who, especially over the summer or whenever. Um, so yeah, uh, Noli just posted a link to your book in the chat. People should uh, should go pick that up. And you know, if there's anything else we can ever do to help you out, if if, you, if anybody has something coming up, please just let us know because we totally understand that the previous apparatus for starting all that is gone right now, <laughs> right? So all right. Anyway, thank you so much, Andrew. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for your uh, your attention, Ridge, and your comments are really really wonderful and, and mean mean a lot. I just feel very uh, seen and and heard and uh, understood from that. So, uh, you know, thanks again. Awesome, thank you. Um, all right, our next reader. Uh, and by the way, uh, I usually I I try to mention this. I last week I was trying to start mentioning it. I always. Well, I completely forgot. But uh, our the chat function on Zoom is a wonderful way for people to show uh, reactions and uh, and appreciation for things. It's also the place to find links to all of the author's social media and work. So please, you know, <clears throat> what was that noise in my throat? That was very strange. Uh, please, uh, you know, hit the chat button, open it up, uh, and take a look at what people are saying. And if you'd like to say something yourself, feel free. All right, with that, and with hopefully no more strange whistles from the back of my throat. Our next reader is Soma Meisheng Fraser. Her work has earned nods and awards from authors and entities ranging from Nikki Giovanni to Daniel Handler Lemony Snicket to Anthony, Antonia Nelson to Billy Collins, from HBO to Zoetrope All Story. Her shorter work appears in Glimmer Train, Ziziva, Hyphen, The Mississippi Review, and elsewhere. Fraser relocated last summer from California, where she served as a San Francisco Library Laureate, to New York for a professorship in creative writing and digital storytelling at SUNY Oswego. All right. Oh, I just muted you because I tried to hit the Ask on Mute button. <laughs> Very sorry. <laughs> you can take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, now I'm afraid to go after Andrew, and this is going to be the opposite of his absolutely gorgeous slow reading because I timed this out and I don't want to go over, so I'm going to read like an auctioneer. Um, I hope you enjoy. She must remember. She must remember, not to mention her wake and bake weed smoking jobless Carolina redneck dyke ex lover's name. She must remember not to draw attention to the heart-shaped marinara smear on her left breast, or to her breast at all, as the upstanding dean of student affairs has already given her sheer white blouse and slightly visible black bra a stink eye once today, guessing accurately that she dresses this way to gain an advantage over the fearless high school boys in her sophomore English class. She must remember not to show emotion or lower her eyes as she threads through the packed hallways, shouting kids, scent of sweat, shiny, narrow lockers. She must remember not to cuss like a gambler with Tourette's staring at a 7-2 offsuit hand. The classroom is yellow with sunlight. This is not a typical secondary school, but an elite private institution 
in a renovated 1920s Art Deco hotel, all high ceilings, marble bathrooms, and dark wood doors. She must remember that the quiet one is Juliet, for the quiet ones become allies quickly before the louder ones realize they love her, that she's their favorite teacher because she lets them talk. She must remember to let them talk, not while completing assignments, but in the brief moments after the bell rings when the French financier's daughter catches her by the sleeve, Miss Katz, to tell her how that late night party where she ended up the last girl drinking vodka with boys she thought were her friends went wrong, or in the early morning before class when the football center who threatened to toss the algebra tutor out the third floor window is waiting for her with a loaf of bread he's baked. Thank you for explaining commas places without getting mad. You never talk to me like I'm dumb. She must remember too that the charismatic mother of the sociopathic Louisiana implant exploited a tragedy, got her son into the school claiming he'd been a straight A student in an institution whose records were wiped out in the hurricane, though it was perfectly clear he'd never cracked a book in his life. The faculty lounge is intimate and warm, connected to an oak paneled reading room and a miniature library. In the library, a classic rolling ladder allows her to reach the topmost shelves, and motes of dust float incessantly, year-round, on some soft current that circulates from nowhere. She must remember not to mention her wake-and-bake, weed-smoking, jobless Carolina redneck dyke ex-lover's name. She must remember to label her cokes or lose them to the dean of discipline. She must remember not to grin as she watches the coke thief rummage through the faculty fridge and imagines the contents of his desk drawers, riding crop, paddle, ball gag, nipple clamps, leather gimp suit, hose. She must remember that the assistant headmaster is a widow who insists on misses, although if the gossip here is to be trusted, she hated her husband, may he rest in peace, and slept around. The Rockefeller room, long conference table, hidden modern lighting, Subtle ivory walls hung with stiff portraits of past headmasters. She likes to sneak in there and stare blankly out the window overlooking the quad when it's not booked for board meetings. Uppity powwows where manicured suits grip and grin and say things like, I don't want to ant fuck about formatting and tell that idiot bean counter to get me the goddamn budget to prove they're still men or can play ball with the men. She must remember not to mention her wake and bake weed smoking, jobless Carolina redneck dyke ex-lover's name. She must remember it's an honor, not a fucking pain in the ass time suck that keeps her at work late the first Monday of every month to sit as the sole faculty member on the fundraising committee and strategize about how to help rich assholes get more money out of their rich asshole friends and contacts. She must remember she was hired for more than even the most seasoned teachers at the school as much for her West Coast connections to wealthy potential donors as for her impressive curriculum vita. She must remember not to push too hard on behalf of the scholarship students. We really need to provide a study abroad experience for Amara because all the other kids' parents have access and she must remember to wear the sheer white blouse and slightly visible black bra on the first Monday of next month if she can get the marinara out. The detention hall is actually just the well-appointed dining hall transformed by the magic of Last Bell. The solid dark wood table at which she sits with the sociopathic Louisiana implant is engraved with furtive carvings. Maya loves Adam and fucking Dean Dickwad can lick my scroat. She is impressed by the apostrophe. She must remember not to mention her wake and bake weed smoking jobless Carolina redneck dyke ex-lover's name. She must remember to convey the egregiousness and foolishness of stealing another student's ideas, presenting them in a portfolio to the class, while avoiding ambiguous or incendiary language that this kid's charismatic mom can use to get her fired before the rest of the faculty discerns he's a sociopath and they've been had by a teenage con and well-heeled con mom and he quietly transfers to another private school. She must remember the name of the rapidly promoted Black New York Times journalist fired for plagiarism in one blow decimating his own career and discrediting affirmative action, at least in the eyes of the reactionary right. She must remember to clarify there's also a reactionary left leaving her personal politics obscure. She must remember why she broke up with her wake and bake weed smoking jobless Carolina redneck dyke ex-lover. The parking lot is nearly empty under a vast cobalt sky. 
It was for her own safety and prosperity, right? Not just a thankless future at a snooty school where payday rolled around and the other faculty lined up to have shit tossed at them. She must remember not to mention her wake-and-bake weed-smoking jobless Carolina redneck dyke ex-lover's name. She must remember that the director of institutional advancement position will open up next week as the incompetent current director is fully phased out. She must remember not to interrupt Mrs. Assistant Headmaster's diatribe about having to stay late, to reprimand a scholarship student, single mom, for the misplaced values that led her to refuse to miss work at a gas station, to attend vital PTA meetings with the other quality mothers who care about their children's well-being, for goodness sake. She must remember nobody here could possibly guess how her own mother raised her on bodega soda pop and box spaghetti, the two of them hustling to pay the rent on a South Bronx efficiency that her wealthy West Coast connections are comprised of strangers she researched online, her curriculum vita is a lie, and she can always spot the cheaters because she's just like them, doesn't give a damn about the rules, invisible people with power drafted, just wants these assholes to pay her an increasingly ridiculous guilt fee to pay attention to their kids. Can't believe a father could avoid raising his daughter to the extent that she thought a home office packed with pleasured, entitled, savage teenage boys constituted a fun, safe evening among friends. The Englander, a stereotype of a pub where the school's administrators get sotted and dish goss about the faculty while the faculty in an adjacent room get arseholed and gab about the administrators is too warm. An aptly scent hangs in the cloying air, reminding her of her diabetic amputee Uncle Garth buried in St. Raymond Cemetery. She must remember not to mention her wake-and-bake weed-smoking jobless Carolina redneck dyke ex-lover's name. She must remember to stick with ale, forgo the hard stuff till she's alone at home in her black bra and pajama pants. She must remember to be acerbically witty and balance that with empathic nodding while her sloshed co-workers start shit-talking the young people they've opted to teach. She must remember to hit the loo, soap out the heart-shaped stain on her blouse before it sets in. She must remember to prolong eye contact with the headmaster's assistant, Ringo, who actually does look like a British pop star and drinks with the faculty despite having the ear of the icy erudite board member hiring up, hitting up the hiring committee. She must remember to hit the hard stuff and soap out the memory of her wake and bake weed smoking jobless Carolina redneck dyke ex-lover's name before it sets in. The kitchen is her favorite room, possibly her favorite place in the entire world. Its peeling walls still hold the soft scent of her ex-lover's fried hush puppies, and there's vodka nestled in the freezer between frozen peas and more vodka. She must remember me. She must remember something of the way I gently held her face like a good mother does her babies and kissed her tears away. The bathroom is too bright. She leans close to the mirror and suddenly realizes she's beautiful as she does every time she drinks slightly too much ale at the Englander. She must remember that I need this role, this deception to ascend, whereas she, much stronger, is free from the urge to climb. The bed is soft, welcoming. She must remember how hard we fought, that fights among equals can never be won. The light is off, the room airy and dark. She must remember that though the world is full of trapdoors, and idiots will hear her accent and smell the weed that helps her eat despite the chemo and mistake her for the idiot, and gorgeous teenage girls are brutally gang raped at late night parties on the leather couches of their financier father's home offices, and good mothers are compared unfavorably with bad ones, and people leave each other even when they love them, maybe especially when they love them. Somebody saw her once, eye to eye and found her lovely. Thank you. Wow, Soma, thank you so much. Um, that was, uh, you covered so much ground. <laughs> I mean, there were so many of those individual lines that could be, you know, could, could have established an entire character. And when you sum them all up, like I really got an incredible sense of, of who this person is, you know, and I think that's sort of the most impressive part is, you know, and, and you did something that I love and aspire to myself, which is a balance of humor 
and true depth, I think, because there were things in there that were genuinely funny. And it was what was fascinating was that repeating line about her ex, depending on the context of the lines around it, was either funny or sad. And that sort of, um, I don't have enough of a sophisticated literary vocabulary, so I'm just going to call it a dance. That, that dance back and forth um, along that line was really um, something to behold. So, and, and, you know, while you, while you did qualify that you were just going to read it as quickly as possible, in a sense, the, the quality of it, the repetition and the, um, I don't want to call it like listing, but it almost is. It's like a series of facts about a person and it really worked really well. And I could see, you know, I, I can see people, especially people who I know are teachers, um, nodding very vigorously at, at the beginning of that. And I think, um, you know, we, one of the sort of themes that has emerged and I, I completely get why is, uh, you know, we have a lot of people come here and read and a lot of people who are particularly writers end up making their money in education. And a lot of those people who have come and shared their work on here are also women. And, um, there seems to be, at least from what I've heard people in reading their work, um, there's a particular necessary performance that, that, women in academics end up doing um and there's a particular um pain that i hear when they read about it or discuss it um and i i just think that, you know not just that but that was part of this three-dimensional picture that you were able to uh to paint for us so it was really um you know i've just noticed an underlying theme we had a, ser a set of writers um several weeks ago who were all appearing in uh, an anthology called Furious Gravity. It was uh, uh, women writers from the DC area. And I think about three of them were about their, either their first year in academics or teaching at a school or any of this stuff. And, and there was so much of that. And then to add on to this, the layer of where this woman that you're reading about is coming from and, you know, the, the, I mean, people who are very qualified have imposter syndrome. So I can't imagine what it would be like if you've lied. <laughs> it's definitely going to be anxiety provoking. Um, although it seems like she's gotten that far because she's able to not have that anxiety all the time. Anyway, uh, I'm fascinated. I would love to hear more both about this character and other things you've written. Uh, I know Noli posted a link to your Twitter as well as um, a, uh, there's some sort of sales link, I assume. So um people should go check her out and uh thank you so much again for coming on the show really appreciate it and uh, i hope you is this your first northeastern winter in like 18 years so this is my second one okay. we came fall of last last year and boy it's i yeah i think i repressed the memory <laughs> <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah, after the after the like shorts and a sweatshirt weather of San Francisco to uh, Oswego, you're going to be in some trouble. But uh, anyway, uh, well, I don't have anything on top of that. That's all. Winter stinks. Anyway, thank you so much, Zoma. Really appreciate it. Um, thank uh, you. Uh, all right, our next reader is Annie Hartnett. She is the author of the novels Rabbit Cake from Tin House 2017 and Unlikely Animals, forthcoming from Ballantine Random House 2022. She has received fellowships from the McDowell Colony, Seawinnie Writers Conference, and the Associates of the Boston Public Library. She lives in Providence, Rhode Island with her husband, baby, and dog. Annie, you should be able to unmute and take us away. Hi, everybody. Sorry it's so dark in here. I don't have another light and I can't get too close to the dog. I mean, <laughs> the baby, <laughs> I'm just thinking about my bio. <laughs> um, <laughs> the dog is right under me and he's, he's not sleeping. Um, so thanks for having me. Uh, I, I wanted, I heard someone asking if uh, Noli was going to show her bunny. Is, do that at the end or, or bunny now? Uh, so just so everybody knows, I should have mentioned at the beginning, uh, we'll leave the meeting open for a while afterwards for people to uh, ask writers questions, ask readers questions, network, comment, and also, most importantly for us here at TGI, show your pets. 
Show the bunny. Okay. All right. So I will go right into the reading then. Um, so I'm reading from my old faithful rabbit cake um, because the other one doesn't come out until 2022, which is going to be like the best year of my life. So we get to kiss and hug. Um, so rabbit cake is, I'm going to read from the beginning of it. Um, it's a, about a little girl named Elvis whose um, mother has just drowned while sleepwalking, um, but it's funny. So it's uh, a comic novel about grief. So it's probably a good book for right now. Um, so that's, um, I'm just gonna read the prologue and then we'll see how much, if I have any extra time, but probably just the prologue. Um, on my 10th birthday, six months before she sleepwalked into the river, mom burned the rabbit cake. 10 might not be a great year for you, she said, squeezing my shoulder. I couldn't tell if she was kidding. The rabbit's face and ears were charred black. Mom always said we needed a cake to mark every new beginning. And whether it was a birthday or a first day of school or a new moon, rabbits mean good luck to a new start. A rabbit cake is baked in a two-sided aluminum mold, producing a three-dimensional cake. That's the miracle of it. The cake stands up on its own, on its four paws. If the frosting job is done right, it looks like you are eating a real cottontail, one that hasn't even been skinned. Why don't you bake another, I asked. I didn't want 10 to be worse than nine. You like burnt toast, mom shrugged. I was happy that after mom covered it with a thick layer of white cream cheese icing fur, I couldn't see the blackened parts. Mom let me help decorate and we used red hots for the eyes. He's a New Zealand white, I announced. A New Zealand white is a medium-sized albino rabbit. They are from Mexico, not New Zealand, and companies test makeup on them. My little research assistant, mom said when I showed her the pictures of the rabbits with sore crusted eyes. Sometimes I wondered if mom even liked animals, even though she had taught me a lot about them when she, and she was the one who brought home Boomer, our border collie from the shelter nine years ago without asking dad. But mom used to test on animals in labs when she was in graduate school at Auburn University. Plus she always laughed when she cut open a rabbit cake. She'd put a half jar of raspberry jam in the middle of the, of the, of the batter so that the cake oozed fake bunny blood all over the plate. What are you gonna wish for, mom asked as she added licorice whiskers to the New Zealand white. Mom was big on wishing. Not sure, I said. I was thinking about wishing for my sister to be nicer to me, but when the time came to blow out the candles, I forgot to wish for anything. That same year, my birthday cake came out of the oven with a scalded nose, ears, and tail. Mom's returned to us in a plastic baggie, her ashes like the gray dust you'll find when you open up the vacuum. The evening before she drowned, Mom made one last cake. She said we'd frost it in the morning. She had one of her bad headaches, and she was going to bed early. The cake was left naked on the counter. It was supposed to celebrate the summer solstice the next day, June 21st, but I guess her death was a new beginning too, for Lizzie and me, for dad and Boomer. It just wasn't a happy one. It was the start of some changes around our house. Dad said we'd have to learn to adapt. Sink or swim, he said. I know that would have made mom laugh. She had a sick sense of humor that way. If mom had been alive, I would have joked, there's something fishy about your death, and that would have been another good one. I was sure parts of mom had been eaten by the fish in the river based on what I knew about decomposition. Dad said he didn't want to hear about it when I asked, but he also said he wasn't going to let Lizzie or me see her body before she was cremated. I thought it was fishy that mom had died by a simple accident. Mom almost never made clumsy mistakes. She was a scientist and scientists aren't careless. So her cause of death fell out of character, unlikely and suspicious somehow. I knew it wasn't the way she was supposed to die. My fifth grade guidance counselor would tell me that those feelings were part of denial, which she called a normal stage of grief. But as the months passed, I couldn't let it go. I knew there was something we were missing, something unexplained. I think a lot about the charred rabbit cake, how that was another clumsy mistake. Mom apologized later that night when she tucked me in. She said it tasted much worse than she thought it would. I have another birthday next year, I reassured her, and the full moon is next week. That's my girl, mom said, tough as boiled owl. Mom, you know no one eats owls, I reminded her. There are four species of owls commonly found in Alabama and sometimes mom and I would get up before dawn to look, go look for barred owls. Most people think that owls mean wisdom, but I read that the Romans thought owls were evil and that they drank the blood of babies. 
In ancient Rome, they would have called the burnt cake a bad omen, and maybe the Romans would have seen it all coming. What would happen to my mom? And then what would happen later to my sister, Lizzie? The disasters in store for us. So that's the prologue. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I was, I was so flustered at the beginning. Um, because I, I haven't really done that much Zoom. I've been just with a baby, so. <laughs> well, you, I, if you'd like to take another couple of minutes, you're, you're welcome to. Oh, um, <laughs> it's up to you though. I will, sure, I can read oh. um, a little bit more. Um, I will read this little section where um, there's a sex scene. Because I know you love sex scenes when they're written from the perspective of children. Uh, <laughs> It's so hard not to hear people laugh when you make gross jokes like that, um, but I know you're laughing. <laughs> okay, so, um, so she's dealing with her mom's death. So this is a couple pages later. I felt bad for dad now, not because he was boring, not because his wife was dead, but because of the secret that I knew, the one I'd been keeping to myself all summer. Less than, a mom before mom, less than a week before mom disappeared into the river, I saw her in the back of a trailer with Mr. Oakes, who used to be the speech therapist at Beaver Elementary. I'd gone to see him in kindergarten when my tongue had seemed too large for my mouth. Now Mr. Oakes worked as the speech therapist for stroke patients at the Evergreen Nursing Home. Evergreen had an animal-assisted therapy program. Miniature horses were brought in to cheer the patients up. It explained where Mr. Oakes had gotten the trailer. In the trailer, mom had been fully clothed and Mr. Oakes had been fully naked and she'd been pretending to milk him. They were laughing and laughing so loud that when I heard them from inside and then I looked and I could see into the trailer perfectly from my bedroom window. They must have thought no one was home. It was an early release day from school. Mom had probably forgotten. How could I ever tell dad or Lizzie about that? How could I put what I'd seen into words? The dictionary said adulterous, infidelity, extramarital, could you divorce a dead person? Dad still wore his gold wedding band. I didn't know if telling dad would make things better or worse for him, and I didn't want to make things worse. When dad wasn't at work, he was sleeping a lot, sometimes crying in his room. He did try to make dinner a couple of times, but usually he let Lizzie do it. Lizzie was a pretty good cook, and I learned how to use the laundry machine. What would I do without you? Dad said as I handed him a clean stack of shirts. My sweet Elvis. Dad wouldn't have thought I was so sweet if he knew the secret I was keeping from him. I wanted to send Mr. Oakes a letter in the mail to tell him I knew all about him and my mom. I cut up magazines, saving the clippings in an envelope for something like a ransom note. Usually it was just one word, something I'd found in the dictionary. Bovine was my favorite so far. Thank you. That's really done. <laughs> oh, Annie, thank you so much. Uh, that was fantastic. I am. Um... I'm in. I'm sold. I'm sold on this <laughs> book totally. Um, I think when you started off by saying uh, that you had written a, a sort of humorous story about grief, um, you know, that's something I think people have not explored enough because, like, the fact of the matter is that while you are dealing with loss, a huge number of weird, funny things happen, and also just like it, life too. And the, the thing I got the most in the prologue particularly is like that's how for me at least um unless there's something wrong with me that's how people think it's this sort of associative like this happened and this good thing happened but that bad thing happened and then this happened if you ever try to think your life through in chronological order i tried to do this the other day i don't know why i just got enormously depressed i don't know like it just it feels weird to do whereas like you know one time when I was this old, this happened, and then this happened, this really bad thing happened, but then this silly thing happened. And it's sort of that, that's a very real way of, of uh, <clears throat> again, much like I was saying with, with Soma's work of letting us into the head of a character. Um, and as for the, uh, the second portion, I have a, um, and it, th those of us here who know me at all know that my exact funny bone spot is that intersection between clever and gross. That's that's like where I live. And uh, you hit it right. When you got to the pretending to milk him, I had to duck out of frame and double check. And actually, you know, on Zoom, if you're making too much noise or if you're trying to talk, it'll tell you you're muted and like warn you. I got that several times during your reading. 
So I think that's the <laughs> ultimate testament to that. Um, so, uh, Thanks so much. So Rabbit Cake is available now, and then you have uh, a book coming out in a couple of, well, not until 2022, it's scheduled. In the beginning, yeah, it'll, it'll be out in the beginning of 2022. And also same weird humor. Funny, yes, but excellent. Dark. Well, everybody, uh, I mean, I'm definitely going to need to read this book and find out more about it because I've, I've told many stories on here about my own experience with grief and the stupid, silly things that happened during the course of that. And uh, I, I'm just, it, I, it's, it feels um, good to just hear a character experiencing the same things in the sense that it's like, oh, I know that. And it's not something any people really write about too much. So that's awesome. Oh, thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Thanks, Amy. everybody. And uh, yeah, Noli just posted all the links you need. So, all right. Our final reader this evening is John Dagada. He is the author of Halls of Fame, About a Mountain, and The Lifespan of a Fact, which was adapted into a Broadway play starring Bobby Cannavale, Cherry Jones, and Daniel Radcliffe, and which has since been produced over two dozen times in the U.S. and abroad. He's also the editor of the three-volume series, A New History of the Essay, which includes the anthologies The Next American Essay, The Making of the American Essay, and The Lost Origins of the Essay. Degata lives in Iowa City, where he cre teaches creative writing at the University of Iowa, and his forthcoming book is about a love letter written in the first century in Greece. John, you can take it away. Thank you. Um, thanks, Ridge. Thanks, Trina. Thanks, Noli. This is such a beautiful thing that you've created. I'm kind of wowed um, by this because I know how much work it takes to uh, put on in a, a you know a series like this, um, and I also know how much you know generosity is involved in. Uh, keeping it going for eight months. That's kind of amazing. So I'm wowed and really honored to be a part. Um, but now I feel like I'm cheating because I, what I'm going to read is a translation. Um, I just finished a book of translations um, of essays by the Greek writer Plutarch, who lived um, in the first and second centuries. Um, but I'm, I'm, what I'm telling people is that I, I'm not really calling these translations, I'm calling them interpretations, because I've, I've taken lots of liberties with them, as I tend to do with everything. So, um, so this is an excerpt from a very short essay by Plutarch that he wrote. Um, I think Classics, people think he wrote this when he was a, a kid, when he was a student. Um, and it's one of two essays that he wrote on vegetarianism. It's a pretty well-known essay, if you know anything from Plutarch. So traditionally, these are titled On the Eating of Flesh and On the Eating of Flesh Part Two. Um, but I have just titled them Flesh and Flesh Again. Um, so I'm going to read from Flesh Again. I'm just going to read an excerpt. And one thing I'll say about Flesh Again in this <clears throat> and this excerpt is that Plutarch makes a, a huge logical leap in the middle of the essay. And um, I think it's, it, it'll be more enjoyable for, for you as a listener to understand that that logical leap really happens in Plutarch. It's not a manipulation of, of uh, the translation. It's really happening. He's really letting his mind go there. And it, that's one of the things that kind of exhilarates me um, about Plutarch as a writer. So um, this is flesh again. Let us try to sin with a little more discretion. Let us eat flesh, but only if we're starving. Let us kill animals, but with a little more pity. And for goodness sake, let us refrain from torturing animals in the name of the culinary arts. 
Let's stop thrusting red hot irons into pigs while they're still alive, straight down their throats and out through their anuses, hoping that the heat of the spit will melt its fat and blood and send it circulating through the body to tenderize the animal from the inside out. Let's stop, let's agree to stop allowing chefs to stomp on the udders of cows who are about to give birth, kicking them in their stomachs and trampling their unborn, trying to achieve an infusion of blood, milk, and fetus which some diners consider a delicacy. And let us stop right now, sewing shut the eyes of swans and cranes and shoving them into crates where they are force fed and fattened until they are pickled and sauced. These are not the practices of the malnourished or the desperate, but of the insolent and the evil. In the beginning, the first animal to be eaten was probably a dangerous beast that people were glad to be rid of. And after that, perhaps it was a little bird or a fish that no one would have missed anyway. And then after having gotten used to the slaughter of anonymous animals, someone stepped it up and slaughtered their own ox, the same ox that had once helped him plow his fields but which now was too old to work. And then someone tried it on a sheep, the same animal from which he'd gotten wool, or a rooster who had once watched his hens. And little by little, the slaughtering became so routine and the people so numb to it that we began to murder each other and to feel no more remorse for the blood that we shed in war as that which we shed at supper. This is how tyrants prepare us for bloodshed. In Athens, the first citizen executed by the government was the vilest of criminals. And this made it easier for the public to gradually accept execution as a standard form of punishment. It happened slowly. Yet with each subsequent killing, the people became so accustomed to executions that they eventually found it reasonable when one day the government decided to put to death the son of one of its generals, and then a politician, and then a philosopher. Even if it could never be proven that reincarnation is real, and that we all exchange the same lot of bodies and should therefore treat them all with respect, finding ourselves sometimes in the skin of a wild animal and sometimes a tame one, sometimes in possession of an irrational mind and sometimes a wise one, it should be enough to deter us from eating flesh to realize that doing so causes such a corruption of our souls that we can't even imagine doing simple things like hosting a guest or celebrating a wedding or getting together with friends for a casual weekend meal without shedding someone's blood. Reincarnation is a leap of faith, but isn't there enough doubt about the afterlife to warrant a little caution? If you were in the middle of a war, in which two massive armies were clashing against each other in total darkness, what would you do if you suddenly spotted a soldier from the other side of the battle who was wounded on the ground and trying to crawl away? Would you charge against him quickly to try to finish him off? Or would you pause to consider who you were about to slaughter? Imagine you had your sword drawn, the soldier at your feet, his neck pulsing beneath you. You can't see his face, but he's a soldier and you're a soldier and your job is to kill the enemy. Suddenly someone yells out, no, stop, that's your father, or oh my God, that's your brother, or what are you doing, that's your son. Would you weigh your chances? In the off chance that in the darkness and chaos of battle, you might be about to kill someone you love, would you hesitate? Would you pause? Would you spare that soldier's life? 
Or would you throw caution to the wind, say, this is war, damn it, and then slay him on the spot? There's a play that presents us with this predicament. There's a mother who has just, uh, who has her own son cornered in a room because she can't see his face clearly. And she thinks that he's an intruder who has just murdered her son. She has an ax raised over her head. She's about to strike him dead. She's screaming at the boy, I'm going to split your skull in two. And every audience member is on their feet, horrified and fascinated by what they're about to see. Then all of a sudden an old man comes up behind the woman and explains that the boy in front of her is actually her son. And she stops and we're relieved because a tragedy has been averted. But what if that old man hadn't appeared? Or what if instead he had stood behind the woman and egged her on saying, do it, he's your enemy, he killed your son. What would be the greater crime? To spare an enemy who had wronged your son or to kill your own child because you thought he was an enemy? When you kill an animal, not out of self-defense, but because you want the pleasure of having it on your plate, and the poor animal is lying there with its head bent back as it waits for you to strike. Imagine a philosopher coming up from behind you and whispering into your ear, go ahead, it's just a beast. And then another philosopher coming up and whispering, wait, what if the soul of your child has found its way inside? Would it really be just as tragic to go without meat that night for dinner as it would be without your child? That's all. Wow, John, thank you so much. Um, I, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, you know, feeling like you were cheating. That was not cheating at all, because first of all, uh, I think if you had come on and read that thing in ancient Greek, none of us would have gotten that much out of it. Um, <laughs> second of all as someone pointed out in the chat you know translation is its own art form in and of itself i mean there's there is um there is uh the only frame of reference example that came to mind was when i remember being uh in college and uh i think it was when the seamus haney translation of beowulf came out and like i had already read a version of beowulf <laughs> i wasn't especially interested in reading another version of Beowulf, but the artistic choices, the translations and the footnotes and things like that details for the reasons for that translation was added so much to the piece and really, you know, all writing uh, to say something extremely high flung is kind of a translation in that we're trying to get thoughts out of our head onto a piece of paper so they can go into someone else's head. So, mm -hmm. you know, you, you are just as much artistically involved in this essay as, as, as anybody. Um, that being said, you know, um, well, while yes, from like a pure logic standpoint, there may be a couple jumps in there. It is incredibly evocative to, um, compare the slaughter of animals with the slaughter of humans. Um, and particularly in the 21st century, um, when probably, I mean, if you really think probably very few people in, in America certainly need to be killing animals and very few people need to be killing people. But there's an awful lot of it happening. And uh, to some extent, our country's success over the past 100 years or so is based on it. Um, actually, no, our country's success over the past, before it was a country. You know what I mean. Um, anyway, <laughs> anyways, it's, it's, it's really uh, like a beautiful, thoughtful meditation on um, killing uh, as, a, as whether or not it's, a, it's an acceptable human act and your... Um, your choice of words, your, uh, um, I mean, people are talking in the chat about the voice that you sort of chose to sort of, um, use this as almost like musing on it, like, like this thoughtful kind of, how did it get started? All this killing stuff, you know, like I bet it happened by accident at first or, or it happened because somebody had to, you know, that, that really, um, it was a nice, sort of ramp into that worldview. So by the time you got to the end, it was, it was really uh, very effective. So 
That's yeah. that's wonderful. So is this part of the the book that you're working on now that has to do with things from the first century in Greece? Or this would be earlier than that, right? Um, no. So the so the book about that love letter hmm. um, is a separate project, but Plutarch is the author of that letter. And okay. It's that project that actually led me to doing these uh, these translations because I I was just reminded I studied classics as a as a kid or as a you know in school and uh, I was just reminded of of um, that voice that I guess people are are recognizing which isn't mine really that musing voice that reflective voice is really Plutarch and I think that. Um, that ruminative voice that we associate with the essay comes from Plutarch. I really do think it, it originates with him. There might be, you know, some, some scraps of it appearing earlier in literary history, but he's really where, where it originated. So um, I'm glad that came through, but it was, it was um, working on that book about the love letter that led mm. to wanting to explore his voice more. Mm. Well, it's excellent. I hope I hope you continue to because I, I think, you know, given how much of that was applicable to ourselves and our times uh, from moral and ethical standpoints, you know, I'm sure there's plenty more in there. So uh, I guess all I can say is please keep going. I <laughs> So anyway, thank you so much, John. Uh, and thank you to everybody for, for coming and reading tonight. And thank you for everybody for coming and listening. Um, really quickly, by way of wrapping it up, as I said before, uh, we'll leave the room open for a while. We'll hang out. Uh, if you guys have questions or authors, if you need a link reposted to, to pick up somebody's work, we can do that. Um, uh, we will also just hang about. And if you want to show off your pets, uh, you can feel free. We have a <laughs> lizard and a rabbit present, so we can we can try that. Uh, and then otherwise, if you want to reach the show, you can find us on Twitter at TGICast. You can also go to TGICast.com, um, where in time, probably tomorrow or Sunday, a video recording of this uh, event will be up. Um, Additionally, you can find me on Twitter at Ridge Cresswell. If you need to directly, you can find the show's founder uh, on Twitter at Trina Tibbs, T-R-E-E-N-A-T-H-I-B-S. And you can find our life-saving, scheduling, most organized human being amongst the three of us, Noli Reed, on Twitter at Noli Reed. If you have people you would like to hear on the show as well, refer them her way. Uh, this whole thing is run on sort of social networking. And by that, I do not mean those websites that want to sell your data. I mean, actual friendships and things like that, um, where it's all been word of mouth. This started from a fairly small group. And as you know, as John pointed out, it's been going for uh, eight months. So just send us your friends, you know, we can, we can get you guys in here and, uh, and everybody can share their work. And, and I feel like the luckiest person because I get to sit here, take it all in, and then actually get a chance to like uh, pontificate slightly about what I thought about it. So thank you all for uh, catering to that tendency in myself as well. All right, with that, I'm going to stop recording.